so even though uh, woodblock printing remains the dominant form of art in the Edo period, for reasons we discussed in Lesson 7, it was much easier and cheaper for merchants to make a profit with it because you could make impressions and sell as many prints as you'd like, uh, painting becomes popular in the late Edo period again. Okay, painting takes a little break for the beginning. Now it becomes a little popular again. And despite the xenophobia and the nationalism of the School of National Learning, uh, many Japanese painters turn to China and the West for influence in their painting. And Ike no Taiga and Yosabu Song are two painters who are very inspired by China, Qing Dynasty style, literati style of painting. It's called in Japanese bunjin. And it's usually characterized by very soft colors, soft brush stroke, very, very big on landscapes and people in these landscapes. Um, so this is very reminiscent of Qing Dynasty Chinese painting, which these two painters were inspired by. And out of the two, Yosabu Sun was also a haiku poet. So in the 1700s, he actually illustrated uh, haiku poetry. So he would write a haiku, and then he would illustrate that scene. So they kind of went hand in hand. He's also famous for illustrating some of Matsuo Basho's haiku and his journeys, his depictions of the journeys of Basho from the previous century. So these are some uh, examples of that type of bunjin literate, literat, literati art. Very, very Chinese. If you look at Chinese style art of this period, it's almost identical. Especially this one uh, looks very, very similar to us. You might think this was a Chinese painting, but it's actually painted by the Japanese in the Edo period. And this is an example of a haiku and then its corresponding art. So you have the haiku there and the illustration that corresponds to it. At the same time, you have some Japanese artists who were members of the Dutch learning school. Their names were Maruyama Okyo and Shiba Kokan. They actually painted pieces influenced by Dutch painting. Okay, And at this time in the Netherlands, realism was the dominant form of art. And so for the first time, you have Japanese artists painting work inspired by the West, namely by the school of realism that was popular in the Netherlands. So you have Japanese paintings that are influenced by Western painting. And this is an example of that here. You know, you see this interesting hybrid of Japanese or Asian style art with the realism of the West. This is another one, right? The colors and the way everything is set up. It's very Western style, but it's still something Japanese about it, right? Or this one. You, can, you, know, you might think this is a European piece of art, but it's actually Japanese, the way that people are being depicted, the colors, etc. This one, you know, if I didn't know this was Japanese, I would have thought it's a it's somewhere in Europe, right? Or, or it is actually a Japanese example of realism influenced by the Dutch style of painting. And a lot of these artists were also members of the Dutch learning school. So it, they went hand in hand. But, you know, even though painting, you know, has a little comeback in the Edo period, the main medium of art during the late Edo period is still woodblock prints. And actually, the two most famous woodblock printing artists emerged during the late Edo period. You must have heard of, heard of them. Katsushika Hokusai. I'm sure you've heard of Hokusai and Ando Hiroshige. Okay, Hokusai and Hiroshige, the two most famous, greatest woodblock printers of all time, emerge in the second half of the Edo period. Even if you haven't heard of their names, once I show you the woodblock prints they're most famous for, you will know who I'm talking about. So Hokusai moved woodblock printing away from just depicting the entertainment quarters or the common people, and he focuses entirely on landscapes. And in his art, he combines Japanese, Western, and Chinese art and he translates this into woodblock print masterpieces, okay? And he's most famous for the 36 views of Mount Fuji, okay? So for the first time, thanks to Hokusai, Mount Fuji becomes a symbol of Japan. Until now, uh, you know, it really wasn't this big symbol or anything, but thanks to Hokusai's woodblock printing, Mount Fuji becomes representative of the Japanese islands. 
and his woodblock prints become very, very popular among the Japanese. This is an example of them. Every single woodblock print he has has Mount Fuji somewhere in the view. Okay. I'm sure you guys have seen this. This is actually Hokusai, okay? And you can try to see if you can spot Mount Fuji. All of his, all of his woodblock prints have Mount Fuji somewhere from different views. This is another example of Hokusai, okay? Uh, Ando Hiroshige is another woodblock artist who is very famous, and he also focuses on landscapes, but he, instead of Mount Fuji, he's famous for the 53 stations of the Tokaido Line, okay? And Tokaido Line is a highway, okay, there's no cars at the time, but it was a road people would travel that would connect Edo, the shogun's city, with the capital of Kyoto. So, of course, a lot of people are traversing this highway between Edo and Kyoto because Kyoto is the capital, and if you need to go see the shogun, you have to go to Edo. So, for example, daimyo who were doing alternate attendance, they would need to use the Tokaido road to get from Kyoto to Edo, okay? So his Hiroshige's art, woodblock prints, all focus on scenes from the Tokaido line, okay? And, you know, you had to stop for lodging or for food, etc., at different cities on this road. And so there were 53 stops or 53 cities on this line between Kyoto and Edo. And so he would depict scenes from those stops, from those cities, on that highway between Japan's two greatest. So this is one such stop or one such area that travelers could stop for rest or shelter traveling between Edo and Kyoto. This is another one. Okay, so I'm sure you've seen these types of woodblock printing. This is Hiroshige. This is another one. Literature in the second half of the Edo period, as opposed to the first half, where you have, you know, haiku and you have plays and you have, you know, love stories, it's a lot more somber, a lot more conservative. And I think that this reflects the emphasis on Neo-Confucianism by the Tokugawa shogun. Remember, the shogunate becomes a lot more conservative in their second half. So this, you know, more somber literature becomes representative of that more somber, somberness in the air, uh, thanks to the rigid nature of Neo-Confucianism. Uh, there's one exception, though, to serious literature. Uh, there was a piece of slapstick prose by Jipen Shaikyu, who wrote a story called A Journey by Foot. And it's this humorous story uh, that covers the life of two friends who travel from Edo to Kyoto. But that's really the only exception to the rule. Most other literature was very serious. And so it no longer focuses on romance or the entertainment quarters. Uh, that was really the first half of the Edo period. Second half of the Edo period is a lot more serious. And you have a lot of history books are written. Um, members of the National Learning School who are obsessed with Japan's past, they begin writing historical fiction, right? So they'll talk about stories set in the past. And, you know, it's, it's just very, literature of this period is a lot more conservative, a lot more somber, thanks to Neo-Confucianism. The tea ceremony still remains popular, but uh, some rival forms of tea are developed in this time, uh, namely by the anti-Confucian anti National Learning and Anti-Studies School. Okay? They believe that the tea ceremony is too influenced by China, okay? and it's too rigid. So they say, let's just spread the tradition of drinking steeped tea, otherwise known as sencha. Okay. Why did they like steeped tea? They said that the powdered tea ceremony that you saw that was developed in the Muromachi period, thanks to China, right? They said this is too rigid, okay? It, it, it's too uh, ritualistic. We just want to enjoy the tea. We can't really enjoy it. Let's get rid of this ritual. Steeped tea doesn't have any of these rituals, right? It doesn't have order. It doesn't have uh, ritual, which is what Neo-Confucianism loves. 
So they think that Sencha is going back drinking steep tea. Sencha goes back to native traditions before Japan was tainted or, or uh, attacked by foreign traditions like the tea ceremony which came from China. So many people who were members of the National Learning School or the uh, Ancient Studies School that were against Neo-Confucianism and foreign influences preferred to drink steep tea because it went against those Neo-Confucianist ideas of uh, ritual, order, and morality. 